the Wildlife Observer Network. All right, welcome to Birding Punks. I'm one of your hosts, Tony Crosdale, with Paul Riss. And this is our first episode. Um, we've been talking about doing this for a while, but unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has given us a window of time to actually make this happen. So here we are. Yes, with uh, work responsibilities kind of slowing down a little bit and actually not leaving the house as much, it gave us a chance. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting this kind of like, it's not, I wouldn't call it free time. I would just call it forced, forced free time. That's I'm actually getting a bunch of things done. I'm finding anyways that I might not have done otherwise because I was just too busy. So it's kind of interesting that this negative thing, you know, we try and turn it into something good. Yeah, I'm. Um, it's interesting. I'm recording vocals for my band at home, although it's really kind of weird because I don't. It's you might think because I do a podcast, I'm savvy with um, audio equipment and programming, and that it would be easy for me. But I'm not actually. I I, I just have a recorder and I upload the the files to the computer and I send it to somebody who edits it. I, I'm, I'm really terrible at such things. So I don't have like garage band or something. What I'm doing is I'm actually just singing lines over a click track <laughs> and then uploading it, sending it to uh, Andy who writes all the music. Um, and he's, he's cutting and pasting it and just putting it over um, the music. And this way in a weird way, I'm going to get, set back the songs and the lyrics might not make any sense. They might be completely out of line. They might be chopped up and even they might be out of order. They might be chopped up, but that, but this way, Oh, I, I've always been good at, for instance, let me take this back a minute. My, my band was Rambo. Um, and I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I informed the members of the band that was singing for them. I had sung once in a band before, um, briefly, but you know, like two shows, five six years before that but i had no idea what i was doing as a singer so to take lyrics to music i sat down with our drummer guitar player and that's how we did it for the first for you know our records and it's been like 12 years since we did another record and i'm you know we're working on this music project together now and i don't know what the hell i'm doing so like and i because i'm I never learned how to do it in the first place. I did it with other people, but I can't, the song, the main songwriter isn't with me in person. So I'm not doing that. I am just, I can't <laughs> sit down with him. So this is how we're sitting down together. Um, but I remember um, I did a discharge cover band for Halloween and in the early days of my band. And my friend was like, man, you're so much better at, you're so much more in time and better at singing, you know, discharge songs than you're on your own band songs. I was like, yeah, because I didn't have to, write the lyrics to these and fit them to the music. They just, I just covered it. So what I'm essentially doing now is I'm going to cover, I'm going to basically, and I'm good at writing parody songs too. So I'm basically going to write lyrics that fit the phrasing <laughs> that Andy makes out of my own attempts. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. That like That's like, that's like perfect punk, man. That's so, that's like the total DIY thing. You're just like, I don't know how to do this. I never really learned how to do this. But fuck it, I'm doing it. This is what's going to happen, and I just have to figure out a way to make it work. I think that's amazing. I thanks. And one of the and it is true. And punk is good and bad for that. It's good as in like, hey, I don't know how to do this. I'm going to do it anyway. And I think that's the most important take home for punk. The problem is, is sometimes you avoid actually learning skills. Because you're just like, I'll just figure it out. I'll find the alternate way of doing it and never actually dedicate the time to actually master a skill. So it's good to do a little bit of both. And part of being DOI is mastering skills. But, you know, I've I made a career out of avoiding things I don't like to do. So – and I don't have the patience for. Uh, back to our um, – yeah, so back to us and where we're at. So we're basically maybe, – hmm. maybe, maybe let's talk about like um, – Let's talk about how we heard about one another because we come from pretty different places. You know, I come from a Southern Ontario and you're from Philly and there would, before the internet, there would be no reason 
unless you toured here and I decided to talk to you after your show, there'd be no reason for us to ever meet, really. Yeah. You know? There, but yeah, we have so much in common. <laughs> yeah, and that, and that's, it's, you know, we're, you're a little bit older than me, we're about the same age, and I remember I was on tour with my band Rambo in Italy, and this guy inter- decides to interview us for a fanzine. So after the show, and, uh, you know, we're in Rome, after the show, I'm, this guy pulls me, you know, so I was like, can I do this interview? I was like, yeah, sure. And one of the questions he asks is, what's everybody's hobby? So I tell him what everybody else in the band does, and I and I end with me. And I say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a bird watcher. I just got back from doing some field research in the, the Arctic. And, and he goes, this is very interesting to me because I am an ornithologist. <laughs> and I was like, yo, what are you doing tomorrow? So the next – so I literally went – everybody else stayed at a squat. I stayed at his apartment. And the next day, he, you know, we, he took me to this like man-made wetland, and we saw a bunch of good birds. And he runs, I think to this day, Med Raptors, which is um, an, a hawk observatory on the very southern tip of Italy, uh, between, you know, we're basically the mountains kind of end right there at the tip of the boot, and then there's a straight to um, Sicily. And as we all know, like peninsulas, um, like Cape May. Um, and uh, what's that spot in um, Sweden? Lots of, you know, peninsulas, especially southern facing peninsulas in the northern hemisphere are notoriously good for, for birds. So that was pretty cool. And again, so like, yeah, how would you and I uh, know about each other? We, we we did it until, I think, I did I first learn about you because of your um, I clothing, did right? Uh, I heard about I you know before I, the presentation. or Or maybe I saw you listed for that presentation. Yeah, that could be. I, I think I remember you telling me when we first met that you were like, I always wanted to go to the biggest week in American birding um, and should pour, pour a little on the ground for this 2020 that's not happening this year. That fucking sucks. Yeah. Um, but, you, you know, you it's a responsible thing to do. But, um, you know, like I remember you saying I always wanted to go to the biggest week in American birding, but I didn't really have like a full-on reason i could you know because it's a long drive for you from philly and and i don't drive <laughs> uh, but, but yeah <laughs> it's not that bad for me it was only four hours for me um but you know and you said well then i heard that this guy was going to be there and he's a punk birder and he's doing a doing a talk about his punk rock big year where i had gone and tattooed the latin names of the birds all over me and i think maybe that was what made you go well maybe this is the year i should go well you go you ran a you held a bird uh birder tattoo contest yeah that that whole thing was actually kim kaufman's idea at the biggest week and i remember her asking me because i was working with them on trying to help make their you know their apparel and their clothing stuff trying to make it a little bit more um uh, progressive looking you know so maybe people would really want to buy those shirts because i think a lot of times before that people were just buying shirts just because they went right and they wear them not you couldn't wear them except when you were out bird watching but my goal was to make stuff you could wear when you were not bird watching so people could say what's on your shirt what is that is that a band what is that and then you could talk about it, right? Um, so I was trying to help them with that. And she said, do you think people would enter a tattoo contest? And I was like, like, even if only five people do, that's enough. Let's do it. Like, that's such a great idea. And so we did that. And I was one of the um, – I was I was not able to enter because I was one of the organizers. But um, I was one of the judges. So that's how I met you because you guys, you and Bull showed up. And and showed everybody what bird tattoos really were. <laughs> and that was hilarious. Um, so my my Facebook blew up when that and when that contest was announced. Everybody was like, "Dude, you gotta go to this, and you're gonna win." Everybody was like, "You gotta go, you're gonna win." And I kept telling everybody the same thing: "I'm going, I'm gonna enter, but I'm not going to win. I'm going to bring the guy who's going to win." And they're like, "No, no, no, you're gonna win, you're gonna win." I'm like, "No." I'm bringing the guy who's going to win. And they kept being like, dude, there's no way. You have to be the guy winning. Like, trust me. And, and you know, Bull, um, bass player of Rambo, um, local legend here. But he's very soft-spoken. And, yeah. you know, he's a birder. Um, 
In fact, you know, he'll say this. Well, he got in the birding because of touring with me. And I mean, he, luck. But I will say this: my bandmates like nature, so it wasn't like, you know, we had a lot in common. They all like to do nature things, so it wasn't like I was forcing them to go out in nature with me. I just happened to bring um, binoculars. And something advice I always give people is: before you buy a super expensive pair of binoculars, buy a spare pair because. Mm-hmm. That way you can increase the amount of birding you can do because you can, you know, if you're like, hey, take a walk with me and hand some binoculars, you get other people to binoculars, but it also serves you because other people can enjoy, you know, it'll increase your opportunities to go birding if other people can go with you. So uh, on my tours, you know, first tour had a little hiatus, wasn't that in the, um, I've been birding since I was nine. And as you become like, a, you know, in your late teens, early twenties, you kind of get distracted by other shit. But then going on tour, in Europe with another band I was a roadie for, I was like, oh, I should bring a bird boat because I can see stuff over here. And I had lost – funny thing, circling back to you, I lost my binoculars, my camo 10 by 50 rubber armored Tascos. I lost them at Spiderland Punk Fest outside of Toronto. Oh, no. I was there in 94, 90, yeah. and a hurricane uh, – not a hurricane, a tornado hit. And everyone Fireman. scattered. And I got – um separated from um the car i came up with and my binoculars were in this car and we never linked back up and in fact um i had to get i got a ride back this is how punk makes no sense um the festival was in outside of toronto but we actually went up and met people in montreal and then went over which makes no sense because you know, Montreal straight north and that area, you know, um, this part of Ontario is like northwest, more more west and north. It makes no sense. So anyway, so Submachine, the band <laughs> Submachine gave me right back to Montreal, uh, which makes no sense because they're from Pittsburgh. I think because they're playing a show. And then I got to ride back. I don't know. Anyway, I lost my binoculars in Canada. And so I didn't have binoculars for a little while. I went to on tour in Europe without binoculars. And then when I got back, my parents realized I got back. I had been, it got pretty solidly back in the burning, and they gave me a pair of Russian tanker binoculars where I had a, you know, um, each eyepiece focused independently, <laughs> and I took that yeah, on tour with me. So I have a pair of them too, but they're not. I don't know that they're Russian. I, I got those. My dad, uh, my dad was um, a fourteen-year-old kid during the Second World War in Berlin, and. He he gave me an old pair of binoculars from back then, and yeah, that like they each eyepiece <laughs> focuses independently. It's like it seems like not the best way to do it, but probably technology just wasn't there yet. <laughs> yeah, that's that's funny. Um, man, that was a good segue, but I forget. Oh, yeah, back to the how we met, right? Yes. So I, yeah, so bull, well, right? Bull's in my in my band, and and he got into birding. So bring an extra pair of binoculars, right? And you know, help you go birding more often. It might make the enjoyment better for other people who you drag along birding, and it might get them in the birding. So Bull got in the birding. Um, you know, we rambled toward all over the world. You know, he before he was officially calling himself a birder, I think he saw like seven species of a hornbill. You know, like um, so <laughs> a lot he of birders are gonna die with none. <laughs> yeah, so he uh, um got into birding and and he had the foresight to um hold back on a bit of his tattoos until he got older and had more money and put, could put more thought into it. So he had a lot more yeah. real estate left uh, for beautiful nature tattoos, including incredible bird tattoos than I did. So when we go to this contest, you know, I show mine off and people, you know, and the, the guests were, um, what's the woman from out was outdoor Afro. What, right. What's her name? I forget. Oh, uh, Oh God. Through Matt. Yeah. From Outdoor Afro, um, Sharon the Bird Chick, but Lily yep. Tyler, right? The the birding yeah, actress, Taylor. Taylor, yeah, Lee Taylor. She was one of the other uh, judges, yeah. Right, and then you were the judges, and so I go up and I show, you know, I have vulture um, vultures, I have uh, my chest, I have a, a scarlet tanager and a scissor tail flycatcher, and I, you know, but it's a, a swath tail kite, greater racket tail drongo. But, you know, this it's cool stuff, and I probably would have won otherwise. And then Bull, and also Bull, Bull is very handsome and very well built. And <laughs> so when the, he, took, he takes his shirt off and there's a gasp. 
Now, I'm not sure if the guy, I mean, you know, he's a very handsome man who just took a shirt off, but he also has these beautiful tattoos and he just brings the house down. And of course he wins. He has a, on his chest is a, um, on his chest and over his collarbones is a ivory belt woodpecker and crossed with a pileated. On the back, it's a milky stork and a wood stork. On one shoulder is a Indian darter. And the other side is a double crested cormorant. A lot of people think he has a anhinga. I mean, it is a species of anhinga, but not what we call anhinga. It's the the Asian one, and because we the Asian darter version. Yeah, because we've seen them in Asia together. And um, he has a pine warbler because uh, he has these beautiful sleeves. And he actually has since bought a property in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. Cool. But but there's a you know pine warbler is a very important bird to us. It's also to cover. I'm supposed to get that uh, magic tattoo with him. It's been like ten years. I still haven't gotten it. Um. <laughs> But uh, we uh, – yeah, so that was really yeah. – that's when I first met you and, and you did your presentation on – what was it called? Uh, it was called Punk Rock Big Year and it was just talking about the year that I spent driving around Ontario seeing as many species as I could. As anyone who's listening is a birder and knows what a big year is, um, anyone who's going to listen to this that's not a birder, uh, big year is just you pick a geographical location. You see as many birds as you can from Jan 1 to December 31. And uh, so I was doing that and I was trying to just help people understand that birding can be uh, for everyone. It's not, you know, everybody always just thinks like, oh, it's for little old ladies with blue hair and tilly hats, which is, and I I always, I had this uh, question on another podcast I was on recently. um, And, and I answer it always in this way that I'm very careful to say that those birders are extremely important. The old birders are, the older generation of birders are extremely important because they're the ones that teach us, right? I mean, nowadays though, I think like a 10 year old could be taught by a 12 year old and they'd get pretty far, maybe further. But, you know, for us, it was kind of like you have your mentors and they teach you. So I'm not saying those birds, I was never intending to say those birders are, uh, no good or bad or, or like a negative thing. It's a bit of a stereotype that we've got as a community, but I think folks like myself and you and um, some other some other birders around are trying to change that, and I think it's working. But like my whole thing was, how, what can I do that's crazy enough to make people go, there's something wrong with this person, until they pay attention and they go, actually, he's just like a guy who works in advertising. He's got a couple of children and a wife and he lives in a nice house somewhere and he's just passionate about birding so i went and tattooed the latin names of them all over me um so i was doing a presentation on that to try and i guess promote that a little bit and and then i i can't remember i think i got a message from you or something saying you were coming or somebody told me hey there's this guy tony crosdale and he's coming to the biggest week and he's signed up to watch your program and i'm pretty sure he's like a, a punk dude and and then i was like oh shit i gotta now now i gotta fucking get my act together because this guy's i was like a listener of punk music you were a maker of punk music so it's like you're a you're a step up a step or two up the ladder to what i was you know i i just never learned to play any instruments and i think maybe i was kind of shy so I never really got, you know, I never really got um, out there and just tried to make punk music. I have some friends who did. Uh, one guy was a drummer. Another guy was uh, actually both the guys ended up being drummers. But I just never had the like urge to go out there and do it, um, you know, make punk music. So I was all of a sudden nervous about my presentation, which I was absolutely not nervous about because I didn't know you and you were the real deal. Like I looked you up and I was like, holy shit, this guy's the real deal. I didn't, I wasn't aware of your band because back in the day it it was, you know, it was harder to find out about such stuff unless you were plugged into the community, which I was just a listener. So, and I was kind of more on my own. And the other thing is, sorry, go ahead. Uh, The other thing I think a lot of um, people who, you know, I see, I assume this is going to be, you know, this is through the Wildlife Observer Network. So uh, our a lot of our listeners are going to be not familiar with punk. And one thing they might not be familiar with is that within punk, there are a lot of 
different subgenres. And oh, yeah. there could be a surprisingly lack of overlap between those different mm -hmm. schisms. So that's another yeah. thing, you know, your band could be like very well known. Like our band was extremely well known in one facet of punk and could be completely unknown to people who, you know, like more poppy punk or melodic punk or whatnot. So that's another, that's yeah. another barrier to, to, you know, and especially pre-internet because my band's heyday was, you know, I mean, the internet started, but it wasn't like it is now, right? You know, it wasn't like nowadays, yeah. like everybody's stuff's on YouTube and, and Discogs and, and um, Bandcamp. But this is before that. People still bought records, <laughs> primarily physical records when we were, when we were a band. <laughs> yeah, which ironically, people are going back to buying, which is kind of nice. I mean, if you can. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I just didn't know about you guys, but when I Googled you guys and listened to the, listened to the music, I was like, well, I definitely would listen to this stuff. I really like this stuff. And it's kind of up my alley. Cause I'm pretty, I'm pretty wide open because maybe because I'm a listener, not a maker. I wasn't into a particular sub genre of punk. I just listened to a whole bunch of it. I just wasn't, hadn't been exposed to you guys, but I like the sound and, and all that. So, um, I, that night, that I heard about it, that you guys were coming. I listened to a whole bunch of it and kind of familiarized myself because I'm just like, as a birder, right? You're just a researcher by nature. Um, so I started doing a whole bunch of research and then got nervous and was like, oh man, these are real punks. I'm just a, like a pseudo punk. <laughs> and, but it turned out we, we got along real well. I, it was really, it was really awesome. And then, you know, forged a friendship across, uh, across a, across the border and but 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 a good one so i think it was a it was really serendipitous that all of that stuff happened and we got to know one another because we had we got a lot more in common than we you know than we may have thought absolutely and we've been in each other's physical presence what is it um three times now right yeah i think so the big week yeah, biggest week and then you've been to philly the twice right yeah yeah and the last time I said this, I said this to you as we were apart and I was like, man, I feel a, I get a, um, a feeling of like camaraderie. I don't know exactly how to articulate it that I, I feel with you that I don't, pretty much don't feel with anybody else because most people get one or two, you know, of the two main things I'm known for, people used to get one or two of them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like. Uh, they don't yeah. get both, and you know, Bull does, but but yes and no. Bull birds, but he's not like immersed in the birding community, and that's yeah. another thing people uh, people don't you know, and that's fine if you just want to bird and actually just enjoy birds. But like, totally, we we are you know, we interact with the greater birding community, and birding culture is important to us as well. So like, for someone that knows punk, what it really means to be in the punk, and the birding community like you do like we do together i mean there's very few so i feel very this this connection with you that i don't really feel with anybody else and you know we get each other on a level that very few people get and um yeah it just feels very comfortable around you because i'm like and, <laughs> and i wish there's more of you because i feel like there would be these incredible memes and puns and in jokes that we could make um that it just you know crossover humor that um, it pretty much only exists with you and me. <laughs> but, and there's a few others. Yeah. You know, my friend Ryan uh, Kleinert, um, he's a piping um, plover biologist. Uh, now he now is a deputy manager of a wildlife refuge up in... Um, Wait, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ryan Kleinert. Is he like like stacked? Like this dude is super built? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I think I know. I think I know him on social media, but he's like... Uh, very muscular. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I know the guy. Um, know and the, guy. the funny thing with him is, uh, we got three things in common because we also are huge UFC fans. Ah, cool. And we're just, and it's funny. It was like, we end up like forging this friendship online. And at one point, like we make plans to go see a UFC show together. Cause he's from Jersey originally, but lives in Rhode Island. Now he lives in Maine, but was living in Rhode Island. He's like, yeah, I'm going to come visit my mom. Why don't we just go meet up for Newark? And, and he mentioned, this will be the first time we ever met. And I was like, what? And I just assumed that Newark from the punk scene. But it was the first time we ever met. 
Um, yeah, and there's a uh, Jeff out in Oregon who takes a lot of photos. It's like Jay Orney photos. Uh, I've known him from back of the day. Um, yeah. Chris Strickland out in Oregon. Um, there's a um, uh, my friend Caleb in Philly. She's really into birding. Um, and um, um, well, of course, there's an article that came up about Audubon. There's a few people in there that I uh, um, I mentioned. Um, which was really, I mean, I thought that was super awesome that 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 that, that Audubon of all things did a thing on punk birding. I thought that was uh, really good that you got them to do that. However, you organized that or were part of that, whatever it was. Yeah, he just, Steve that, Newman just um, reached out to me out of nowhere, and yeah, um, that's that's wicked, man. Because I think that's like one of those that's one of those like long time, uh, very you know conservative feeling organizations that all of a sudden did that. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Oh, Ra- Ra- Callis, who I'm thinking of in, in, in the Bay area, she was in that article as well. Yeah. It's funny. I gave him your info and I don't know whatever happened with that. Um, and, uh, yeah, some, sometimes you can, you can only chase down so many leads, right? Yeah. Like you get what you need yeah. and you got what you, need. and it doesn't really matter. It would just be, you know, I would just be echoing other things. So it probably, maybe we're just too similar. Yeah. He yeah. looked me up and went, well, that's like interviewing the same fucking guy. So yeah. Forget that. The funny thing was, the scene of comments that was so funny because, like, um, I would see, you know, and I never, I'm not going to respond. I'm not going to start arguing with someone on, on Instagram or Facebook about it, you know, because so many people would tag me on, on Instagram and Facebook about that, you know, like, and then I would see comments and, or people comment on, on, people will comment on the original post or people will comment on something that someone shared. And I would see stuff that would crack me up because so many people, I think, thought like that. And then they must have not read the article, and you know, because in the pictures I have, the, you know, well, you keep there's not really many pictures. There's only one picture I think of me, and you don't really see much of me. You just see like my tattooed arms, and you can see my beard. And yeah. um, and I, I know hipsters have tattoos and beards these days, but um, and and so people comment like, "Oh, hipsters getting into birding, you know, just getting into birding." And I was like, "Dude, I've been birding since I was nine, <laughs> you know." And like, like, and the whole I think the point of the article that he makes is that I got into punk because of birding, not not like, oh, I'm, I'm you know, I'm looking for a hobby. You know, these are, yeah. these two identities are like completely intertwined for me because I got into punk like when I was young. I grew up in the city and I would get in fights and I was just a weirdo kid who liked nature um, and luckily I'm a big guy so once I got old enough where people were no longer bigger than me, then by being older than me that, you know, I, I got jumped a couple times since then, you know, by groups of kids, but I figured out where to avoid that. Um, but once, you know, it pretty much stopped and, and, um, I hung out downtown with punk rockers or whatever, but I got, I was a weirdo because I, I liked nature since I was a little kid. And when you stop reading Ranger, when you're old enough to stop reading Ranger Rick and start reading like nature conservancy, you know, national wildlife federation magazines, whatever you realize is this thing that you love is under siege. And that society and the government is complicit in it. And you're like, you're a kid, you're, you're a weirdo, you're mad at society and government, and, not, and you're getting into your teens. I mean, come on, like, punk is what you're going to get into. Mm-hmm. You know, what other music speaks to that? You know, like, there's music for, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, I mean, you know, there's plenty of pl- political hip hop and whatnot out there, what have you, but you know, not so much in, I mean, there's public enemy and whatnot, but I don't know how much environmentally conscious hip hop there was around in the early nineties, but not that I'm aware of. Yeah. But I mean, it's, this was like, I was primed to get in the punk and yeah. it wasn't like, Oh, I happened to have been in the punk for a while. And now that I'm getting, you know, into my late thirties or early forties, I'm looking for a hobby. It's like, I was a weirdo and man of society because I was a birder. And then punk was there. It was like, made sense, you know? Yeah, I was literally at think- an Earth Day. I was wearing a Cure shirt and an Army jacket when I was like fourteen, no, fifteen at an Earth Day rally, and these like a couple <laughs> punk rockers walked up to me and they're kind of almost like evan- evangelicals. You're kind of like, hey, you, know, you ever heard of Crass? <laughs> you know, it's like, like hmm, <laughs> tell me about Crass, Eve Libertine. Do you say? Hmm. So yeah, so if, yeah, so anyway, that article. And you weren't in it, unfortunately, but, you know, hopefully. 
<laughs> but that kind of also made me think about this. I was like, man, if Paul and I can't just naturally get put together, let's order, let's make ourselves get together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hence, Burning Punk's podcast. Um, but uh, like, I'll tell you, like, the whole thing for me about because um, it was the same is the same same kind of thing for me was like, um, I don't. I remember the first time I came out with this idea of punk birding and there was one person who um i i I'm not going to I'm not into naming names but there was one person who said um something like eh, fad they're just they're just uh biting the style off of like some kind of Nikon extreme bur- burning the edge or some shit like that. I'm, it's not even something I was aware of, but I thought that was hilarious. I never said anything because I don't generally, as you say, like I'm not going to engage with somebody about that stuff. Um, if they're not digging what I'm doing, then I really don't care. It's just not for them, obviously, and that's totally fine because it's for some people, for sure. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it was the same thing. It was like, no, 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 I... I, I like I got into birding, <laughs> I've been a birder since forever. <laughs> you know, my dad took me birding the first time when I was probably 10 or 11 years old. And he took me to a place and black cap chickadee landed on my hand and I was in, you know, just like it was, that's how I got into it. And then I just started, we, you know, I started building this relationship with my dad that I don't know that I would have had otherwise. Cause you know, he's, you know, back in the seventies, you know, supporting the family going to work a lot but on the weekends he would just take me birding all the time any anytime we had time off he would just take me birding and and i think it it built our relationship but i was um we could never agree on what to listen to <laughs> because my dad is quite a bit you know like i'm 49 now my dad just turned 89 so they, like he had me late in life, so our musical tastes could never even converge in any way. You know, like because if you if your dad grew up listening to uh, Black Sabbath and Zeppelin and things like that, then eventually as a kid you're gonna learn about that stuff and go and all of a sudden you kind of think, oh, my dad liked some cool shit when he was younger. Um, but my dad grew up listening to jazz, you know, in Nazi occupied Germany, so. We really didn't see eye to eye musically. Uh, so we were just often just listening to talk radio or not any music at all when we were out birding. But like when I first got into music, my mom had a record store. So I was exposed to a lot of different things. Um, but I actually started out super interested in hip hop. Like when Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five and all that stuff came out, I was super jazzed by that. And then. Like I naturally, as time went on, I sort of progressed and then found out about the Beastie Boys and then found about the Beastie Boys, what the Beastie Boys were <laughs> before they were hip hop. And then I was like, oh, shit, listen to that. And then I kind of started going probably a little bit more down a metal path. And I, but I just kept finding nothing was fast enough or aggressive enough for me. I just kept on searching for more and more aggressive, faster and aggressive and faster um, and that, that's how I got into the really heavy stuff with just, I, I just wanted it to be faster and heavier and sloppier. And that, that's how I got into punk music. And then it just, like you say, it's the two things were birding and punk were happening simultaneously. You know, when I was at home listening to music, I was listening to punk music when I was not at home, I was out looking at birds. <laughs> so you can't, for me, you can't separate birding and punk. Now, I also know a few uh, punks. I'm sure you know uh, Alvaro. Do you know him? He's, I think he lives in Peru now. Do you know that guy? No. Alvaro, um, I just, I'm going to pronounce his name wrong. Uh, I'm just going online right now to just look at it to make sure I pronounce it right. Um but he's totally uh, so Alvaro Yarmil. Oh, you threw me off by Peru. Yeah, we we oh, we're, we're good. Bu- we're buddies. We we saw stiff little fingers together during the uh, um during the uh, um yeah he lives in California. 
But he he, yeah, well, he, yeah, he wrote the, the field guide to the birds in Chile, and he leads guides there a lot. Yeah, we we went to um, see Stiff Little Fingers because he played uh, during the uh, birding expo. Oh shit! I wish yeah. he was there. That would be amazing. Yeah. Well, he told me about a time when he, and I think it was maybe at the Horseshoe Tavern in Toronto, which is like a pretty legendary rock uh, venue. And I think he told me about a time where he saw Black Flag there, and they stayed up all night and then went birding the next like the next morning, but didn't sleep in between. <laughs> they went and chased a bird the next day, and I always thought that was like that's ultra yeah. meshing of birding and punk. You see Black Flag, and then you stay up all night partying with the band and then you go to see a bird oh guys i got we gotta go because we're gonna go chase a bird I'm just curious what the members of black flag were thinking if they told them that that would have been hilarious <laughs> it's, you never know i mean depends on who the singer was but i mean uh, yeah henry was a pretty you know and most of the yeah i mean i know they had a number of singers but the bulk of the band's history was with rollin so and he's a pretty intellectual guy so I mean, i would assume the other members were that band's kind of highbrow despite the, <laughs> the legendary yeah. stories that's oh so um andy burnick um if you ever heard of the band the swirlies they're kind of like a shoegazer proto indie rock band from boston but they you know have punk roots all the members of you know were into punk um their bass player is an ornithologist like got his phd studying black on light herons in new york city and and we we uh, his wife was getting her master's in Philly and they were living here for a while and we became really, really good friends. I mean, he was at my wedding and, and, um, uh, um, we, uh, were a world series birding team together. So there's him. In fact, he, uh, early in our friendship, he showed up and his head was shaved. And I was like, well, dude, what's up with that? Cause he had a full head of hair. It wasn't like he was going bald and shaved it. He's like, Oh, I had a mohawk. Cause I was, um, in a black fly cover band for Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, my really good buddy Liam Wilson, he's the uh, bass player. Well, was the bass player Dolan Escape Plan before they broke up, and he's in a few other bands um, right now, like uh, John Frum and oh, I can't even pronounce the names. Like Azura, which is a band from Norway. Um, yeah, we go birding together. Um, John uh, Dwyer Baisley from um, Baroness. Um, we're, oh, yeah. we're, we're we're buddies, and he he's he does a lot of bird art, and we keep talking about going birding together. I'm gonna have him on this podcast soon to talk about um, his bird art. Is, that would be amazing. Yeah. I and was uh, yesterday. <laughs> well, oh yeah. He's we did, We did a nausea cover band together for Halloween three years ago. Cool. Yeah. And, uh, and it's funny. I wasn't actually a Baroness fan then. Um, I, I assumed I wouldn't like him cause they were in my mind too slow. Uh, and yeah. then from, but I knew him around for a while and I asked him to, you know, um, do this cover band together and we, it was really fun, and I really got to, and I got to know him really well then, and really, really, you know, liked him. And I was like, ah, I should. I hear the latest record's really good. I should get it. And you know, it's, it sounds like it's maybe. I thought they were more like stoner rock. So I was like, well, this newer record, I think it's more rock. Maybe I'll like it. And that purple record is one of the best records I've ever heard. And then I went to see him live, and um. They, they blew me away, so I, I looked up their back catalog, and I, 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 I like all their records. And um, I was really surprised because I, you know, I, I assumed that there were wouldn't be something I liked, and I think they're incredible. I mean, if I like the Cure, and I like metal, so if you mix them together, you get kind of get the get Baroness at least their later stuff. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, the pur- yeah, purple. I'm just looking at some of the images. I also really love... Does he do the artwork on their records? Yeah. Oh, fuck. It's so good. I've always loved this artwork on, on Baroness Records, man. It's so... Ugh, he texts me with, with pictures of his bird art all the time. Huh. That's yeah. Amazing. Like, yeah, he's... I should, I should look him up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I like to... I want to have him on. Um, I don't know if we could do a three-way call or not, Um. So I'll have to look into that because it'd be interesting to get you guys to talk about art, but, um, you know, that would be, that'd be, that'd be cool. Yeah. That would be amazing. Get to talk to somebody that, uh, another person whose music I really enjoy too is always great. Yeah. I'm trying to, you know what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to find some, I'm, I'm actually on my, um, my PRBY, uh, Facebook page. I'm not plugging. I'm just, I'm not plugging. Well, I'll plug, I'll, I'll, 
I, I will plug because um, I love your shirts. You know, I've actually hired you to do a shirt for my, um, I don't, I'm trying not to talk about work. Um, I don't want to mix the two because, uh, um, you know, all you got to say is something negative about cats. Well, I'm a cat owner and love cats, but all you got to say is something like that, you know, in this day and age with cancel culture, um, I believe in cancel culture for the right causes. <laughs> you know, if you're a, if you're a racist or homophobic, transphobic, uh, uh, sexist and, and act accordingly, eh, maybe you should get fired. But if you have a differing opinion about the management of feral cats or, you know, something like that, and then people try to harass your work to get you fired. Um, uh, so I try to keep my, uh, you know, let's just say I do work in a similar field. Um, so I, uh, I try to keep them, but anyway, so I hired you and your, and your wife, uh, to, um, she does the, she, so she does the, illustrations and you do design right well you know what we kind of we kind of split it up but for the most part um you'll notice anytime i do a bird drawing it's much more simple like rachel just has something that i don't have which is the ability to capture like to capture what something really looks like just by looking at it and studying it and you know like like an artist like a fine artist that she is I'm more of a designer, so when you look at my stuff, it's like chunks of color that are roughly the shape of, and it like hints to it as opposed to is actually it. Um, so anytime you see a design from my from uh, Rachel and my place, if it if the bird looks pretty accurate, she did it. If it looks like it's flat solid colors, I probably did it. <laughs> um, but yeah, we work we work together on it. We both do. We both do a little bit here and there, so it's kind of, you know, it's kind, it's kind of, um, we balance each other out nicely when it comes to the designs, and we always have like a back and forth on typography because we have very different opinions on the right way to do it, and that's always fun. <laughs> I, I'm divorced. But... What's up? <laughs> no divorce yet. But, yeah. You know. <laughs> If we get a divorce, it's going to be either typography or the sound of me chewing. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love your shirts. Um, it's funny. My only complaints with your shirts is often they're too abstract. Um, and I said it yeah. to you, I'd like give me some more overt ones because um, I, for a lot of people, they like, they want a shirt that you don't necessarily know is a burning shirt or can stand on its own. And I get that, you know, and it makes sense. But me. You know, I'm covered in tattoos. Um, and I just kind of, I've kind of, it's funny to see a, a, a vert bird shirt on me. You know what I mean? Like, so I love just wearing like a, you know, a shirt just like, that's not cool looking at all. It's just like a bunch of falcons on it. And I mean, like, falcons of <laughs> USA or like this wildlife refuge. Like, I like that because it's kind of funny to see that on me. Um, yeah. So I like shirts that are clearly a birding shirt. Um, and I, so I like the ones that you've made that are more overt. Um, but with that said, you know, I like the, I like them all. And I, I, I'm glad that they exist. And you started making more. You stopped for a while, right? Could you explain that? Yeah. The reason we stopped was just because um, uh, it was getting too difficult to, um, to, like, have stock and have a place to keep it. And then, you know not sell some of it, but sell other of it and this and that. Um, and ev like eventually certain sizes just wouldn't sell. And so we would just like donate them to a, you know, like a Sally Ann or something like that. Um, and <laughs> I have a funny story about that, but, uh, so we just kind of got a little bit, it became a little bit too much on top of our actual jobs and raising our children. So we decided to take a break and, and we got a lot of people were kind of upset about that. You know, they were not, they did not like the idea that we stopped. And then I also found that people were kind of wanting them for less money and they were wanting different colors and different sizes. And when you carry stock, it's very, very difficult to do that because I basically would have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars and hope that I would sell it. And that's not my financial position. So what I did was just stop doing it all together. 
I still made designs for like Biggest Week and other places. Uh, Cape May, I did one for, and 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 one in Cleveland. Uh, a few different places had asked, and then the price of my work was too expensive. But I, you know, and I and I was already at a low rate because they're all nonprofits, you know. But I can't I can't just do it all for free because I need to feed my family. Um, but so we just decided to stop. And then it was interesting because it created a like more of a need for it for some reason when we stopped all of a sudden. And then I just thought, you know what, I should just pick it up again. I just have to do some work and figure it out. And I was trying to work it out with a local printer here in Hamilton and have them ship globally. And then they just killed that part of their business because it was just too time consuming, which ironically is all of their business now. They've had to bring it back because there's no going into their store anymore right now. So they're just only doing it that way. So there may be a new shirt coming. Who knows? Maybe it'll be a bird birding uh, punk shirt. <laughs> um, but then I, so I found this thing called Redbubble and they basically manufacture everything. And then I just set what the markup is on stuff. So it is whatever their cost is plus my markup. And then, so I make a lot less money per shirt nowadays, but I don't really care. I'm just, I'm kind of just doing it for fun. So literally if somebody reached out to me and said, Hey, I want a shirt with an Eastern Meadowlark on it. And they were the only person on earth that wanted one. I could do it now because I would just upload it to Redbubble and, Everybody who's gotten stuff from there is happy with the quality, so I feel good about it. Um, yeah, I don't want to name names, to... Um, um, but I have a a very good friend who makes um, wildlife art shirts. Um, I should put you guys in touch. Um, but he has one of these online, sounds like a similar deal, um, make the shirts. The problem is they're not screen printed. Right. I don't know how, yeah. I mean, maybe it is a type of screen printing, but the, um, the ink doesn't hold up on the shirts for very long. The image like fades away. Um, I'd say within a year. Well, you're, I don't know about your new producer, your new manufacturer, but the shirts, I have shirts from you that are like a good number of years old where like literally the ink is holding on and the shirt isn't like the shirt, like the, the ink's holding together and the shirt itself is, is, is threadbare. Right. So, um, yeah. And I, and I like the quality of your shirts you use. They're very comfortable. So is your new, uh, manufacturer, um, are the shirts of the same quality and does the ink last? I don't know the answer to that question yet. Cause I just started it, but, and I had no way of really even sampling it. <laughs> so, Basically, what I did was I told people, I, this is not much in my control. I'm just doing this because everybody's asking me to. And go ahead and order one. But I reached out to the people that I know because it, it tells me all the emails of the people who order it because they make an account. And so I would email them and say, do you like it? Do you like it? Should I stop doing this? And they all said, no, keep doing it. But I still don't. I've still never seen one. Yeah. <laughs> I was out with a guy the other day, Birding, who was wearing one. Of course, we were keeping one turkey vulture's wingspan apart while we were birding, but he was wearing one, but it was under three layers, so I didn't, and it was cold, so I didn't ask him to see it. <laughs> so I've been in the vicinity of one, but I still haven't seen one. Yeah. Um, but I would imagine it's not screen printed. There's no way they could do it. You know what I mean? There's just right. no way they could do it. So, and I also had people saying, hey, I'm, you know, I don't like wearing t-shirts. Can I get this on a, like a skirt? or a scarf or a mug or something, a mouse pad, anything. And that's another thing this Redbubble does. It allows people to put whatever design they want on whatever item they want. So it's really flexible. So therefore, the quality will suffer, I'm sure. I think for a guy like you, don't bother buying one because you like a certain kind of thing and you, like me, are very particular. But some people are just not as worried about that. They just want to wear something that they like the look of and – so that that's kind of where I'm at with that. I I would I wasn't I, even going to do it again, but people were just bugging me a lot to do it, so I, I wanted to help them out. <laughs> I have a friend that um, does um, merch for bands. Um, has a company that does that, and I mean, he, for instance, I'm trying to think of other bands, but I know for a fact he does Bolt Thrower, right? 
Yeah. And I have one of the bolt thrower shirts and it's a soft, very comfortable shirt. And the ink is gorgeous and is held. Um, and I mean, I know there might be an economy of scale there, but um, maybe I'll reach out to him and just mention what you're doing. And, and perhaps that's an option, you know? Um, yeah. Because uh, well, it's he's probably very much like the one I use here in Hamilton. They're like, it's a small company. I think there's three employees, four employees, and they just do really good work. And I love them. But once they stopped allowing me to do pre-orders, then it was no good for me. So, yeah. But now that's his whole business model because because of COVID-19, like he has to do that business model. So I might like do a few special editions through him. So I'm, I'm, I'm considering that. And in that case, those will be just like your friend. And I would, I mean, if your buddy's doing that in the States, I would totally work with him too. I have no problem working with. Yeah. I'll give him a shout and see what he he says. Um, man, um, we're almost at an hour at this point. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, It's easy, easy talking, man. But we should, um, we should probably wrap it up because I got some work to do. I'm doing work for right now. I'm doing some, my agency is doing some work for the Boys and Girls Club of Canada. And um, again, not a plug, but just like it's so important what those people are doing right now. And I'm sure it's similar in, with the Boys and Girls Club of America. Um, like they used to do, um, they used to do, uh, what do you call it? have like clubs, physical locations where kids could go and hang out, right? In, in uh, kids that, that required the service. And some of them would go there because they didn't have a computer at home and there was one they could use there. And some of them would go there like quite literally just to get a, something to eat for dinner because their parents work in two or three jobs and all this kind of stuff. So they've had to close all their physical locations for obvious reasons. And now they have to, like they have to, their, their business model has to pivot. So I'm, I'm trying to help them figure that out. And, uh, it's very important work because there's now all these kids, you know, like hundreds of kids, like right out of my neighborhood. Cause there's one in my neighborhood. Um, and, uh, you know, cause I don't live in the more gentrified part of town. I live in, in a little bit, uh, more real neighborhood. I don't know. That's, that sounds like I'm an asshole, but I'm not, I just mean it's a neighborhood that's got a, a mix of different, um, income levels in it. Um, and I, and I just think that it's so important for those kids to have somewhere to go, something to do, or in in some cases they're just giving them food, you know? Yeah. So that's what I'm working on right now. So I got to devote some time to that this afternoon. That's, that's great. Yeah. Maybe, um, I'll talk to you. I'm sure our next few days and our next episode, we'll figure out when we're going to do that. Maybe we can, we can talk about um, things, to, things to do. How to bird inside? <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a good one. Because as we're as we're doing this podcast, I'm looking out my window of my studio in my house, and there's I can hear the cardinals out there. Like they're super active right now, and there's going to be more and more stuff showing up day after day after day because COVID means nothing to them. But yeah, I think it would be good if we could help people. A little bit. Give them ideas or hear their ideas, you know, get them to do a live texting thing where they can tell us what they're doing. We can share it with everybody. Yeah, that'd be great. We should do that. And oh, my friends in Australia um, doing it all over. They have a Facebook group called Bird the Heck at Home or no, Bird the Feck at Home. Bird the Feck yeah. at Home. And yeah. they're keeping a master list of everything people have seen from home. Um, and they have a lot of really cool birds with it, but someone has met. So far in the list, they have black bear and saltwater crocodile. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> we are um, not getting – well, I could get a black bear up north in my, up where my cab, cabin is. It was woods, funny but... is you live in Canada and I live in Philadelphia and I've had a black bear on my street. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, I've seen black bears in the at the garbage <laughs> where I take my garbage up north, but <laughs> we haven't. There's been ones around our property though. The guy across the street from me is a hunter, and he took one for food last year. So they're around. It was big. Yeah, we um, in Philly we get a. Uh, well, for a lot of people, the things people don't realize is even though Philadelphia is a massive city and in one of the densest cities. Um, in America anyway for housing it's 
we actually have a, a huge park system and I live yeah. right next to a, a giant park. And I'm also in the very northern part of the city anyway, only less than a mile, I think, from the border with uh, Montgomery County. But a um, we're, Pennsylvania and New Jersey have a giant, a very dense black bear populations. And oh, yeah. the, the young ones, when young males, when they come out of hibernation the second year, I think the mom's like, get out of here. And then the dad, you know, the, the whatever the brewing of that turf is like, you got to go. You're, you're sexually mature now. You're my competition. Get out or I'm going to kill you. Yeah. And then they, go or die. <laughs> yeah. So they, they start wandering and, you know, they probably wander the next Bruins territories to get out of here. And then the next one, and the next one, and then eventually they're like walking on train tracks and, and suddenly like, Oh, I'm in Philadelphia. Um, I'll eat out of the garbage. And, you know, I, I hate to say it, but a black bear that's eating out of garbage in a city is going to, that's a death sentence. And you know, it's going to get oh, hit yeah. by a car or, you know, the police or something's going to, you know, have to put it down. It's going to get into trouble. So they, you know, they yeah. dart him and then they take him up to the, to the mountains, which are, you know, an hour away from, from here, from my, less than an hour away from this part of the city. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, oh, another thing I want to do, we got to figure this out. Um, is I want to do, I want to put together like a PowerPoint or not. I want to put together um, a whole bunch of punk birds. What I mean by that is like the, there's a lot of logos. Maybe you could, we could both think of this. There's a lot of logos of punk bands that are birds, right? Mm -hmm. And I want to do an episode where we identify them. Oh, that's cool. And some of those people actually know, and I could track down and be like, what the hell were you thinking? Like, what is this? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, why? <laughs> yeah. Well, like tragedy, uh, really good friends of mine. Um, and I love, I think it's either a pheasant or a parrot. And, and so all these people have, and not that pheasants or parrots aren't tough, magnificent birds, but all these punks that have the tragedy bird tattooed on them. I'm like, the only thing that would fit that, you know, maybe a wedge tailed Eagle, but the wings should be way longer. Right. So like, I'm like, what, what would you have gotten? A, a, and I keep meaning to do this. I keep meaning to get a picture, uh, a, a McCall, um, like the outline of the bird, but filled in like a McCall as a tattoo. Yeah, this does, this does look like it could be a McCall type, like a, although a ragged one. Yeah. Um, maybe he's molting. <laughs> and like Amoebics, who one of my favorite bands of all time, although the singer recently said some horrible stuff online, although his brother, I mean, the the guitar player is also a songwriter and has condemned it. So I don't know. Can you still listen to a band if one member ends up being shitty, but the other is still great? I don't know. Their logo, their, one of their logos is, I always thought it was an eagle. And and uh, he told me it was Raven. I was like, but the bill's hooked. Anyway, so <laughs> we can. Um, like, like and, an eye or so. so I got to figure out how we could do that because um, I'm not very savvy with video. So we got to figure out how we could. Um, uh, time that right do you, but i could think yeah. about also maybe you know like putting up like a voice thread or something <laughs> so, or some kind of a a uh um or something you could follow along like we could somehow publish the powerpoint or something and you could follow along <laughs> and, uh, and and see the logos i know how to do that i could probably do that i got a drop i got a pro pro dropbox account i could probably put a um like a or you could do it as like a uh like a uh Google, uh, a shared Google uh, slides document or something, and people could just log in and have a look at it. Like, there might be a way to do it. Yeah, maybe I'll make a PowerPoint and send it to you. Or yeah. um, or we can also, um, I don't know if you know how to do video at all. It would just be static images, but it had to be a certain time, so I don't know. Um, well, I'll get working on that. Um, take care of yourself and your family. Everybody at home, um, this is all going to be on on YouTube as well as and it's not going to be video, obviously, but it's going to be on YouTube as well as on um, iTunes or what have you. So please like and review, uh, spread the word, and there'll be more of this content coming. So thank you from Punk Birders from the Wildlife Observer Network. Cheers, everybody. Stay safe. Bye-bye, YouTube.